Do you care for some coffee, Hatchet? Oh, that's very kind of you, Jason. Would you bring an extra cup for Mr. Mobbs, please? Can I help? Mm hmm? Oh, good heavens, no. I'm sure you're not supposed to see anything that's in here. Oh, no, no, I'm sure I'm not. Ah. Yes, good. I'm getting a little bored with your department. Oh, oh dear. You don't give you a lot of trouble, surely. Well, let's say I find your continuous recruiting drive rather tedious. Ah, well, there's had to be a rather massive rethink since that tiresome business with Mr. Philby. Everything is changing. In what way? Well, shall we say that we're not so desperately keen on Etonians as we were? Old Horovians are in this year, I take it. Mm. Ah, you have been rethinking it massively, haven't you? What do you want? Jason, Hesketh? you never seem to take us seriously. Hesketh, I don't suppose you'd care to come to the point. I do have several other engagements. Ah, well, the thing is this, you see. We're rather interested in one of your people. He seems to us to be a most likely person. Most uh, likely indeed. We have no one by the name of James Bond in this office, Hesketh. Oh, my dear chap, he wouldn't be at all the kind of person we'd be interested in. That ghastly virility. I can't imagine what Ian was thinking of, really. Who are you interested in? Well, not so much me. His father. Father has been taking a great interest in him. Has he? Who? Oh, just a minute, just a minute. Um, name of... Dowding. Dowling. Lincoln Dowling. Nothing against him, do you know? Only that if you recruited him, he'd be a bloody idiot. But at the moment, he isn't. Far from it. Mm. Manchester Grammar School. Oh, well, I suppose that's a lot in his favour these days. I can see the parents of the future spies rushing to transfer their sons off the Eton list. Oh, Jason, do be serious for a moment. It's the country we're thinking of. God. Anyway, we'd like to keep an eye on this Mr. Um, Dowding. Dowling. Who? Or white, Hescott. Mm. Oh, no, thank you. I never touch it. I might just have one of those Garibaldi biscuits, though. How about Margot Fellowship? What about Margot Fellowship? I just wondered if you'd like her to be invited. She always seems agonizingly keen on you. Margot Fellowship's a fool. Darling, 50% of the guests are likely to be fooled. She'll merge quite happily. What guests? My debut as a diplomatic hostess. For the good of the country, I gather it's essential that its leaders meet regularly and drink champagne. Hmm. When? 28th. Oh, I'll check your list when you've finished it. You might at least give me a little guidance as to who or who is not at the top of the pecking order at the moment. I have a man who does that for me now. Lincoln, darling. Oh, no, he isn't. 
Oh, very well, I'll take it. Lady Fellowship, good morning. Sir John isn't here yet. Can I help you? Well, I'm sure he'd like to come. Is that Sir Wednesday, isn't it? Oh, very well, I'll tell him. Thank you. Well, I hope to see you again soon, Lady Fellowship. Goodbye. Morning, Lincoln. Morning. Morning, Lady Wilder. Good morning. What's this? The Lord Bly would like to have a look at it. I've done a half-page abstract, which pretty well covers the main points. What is the main point? Mm, I say it could be roughly called a rescue mission. What does that mean? The Lord Bly wondered if you would drop in and discuss it with him. I see. All right. Fix the time, will you? And he said 12 noon for drinks. Did he? Make it 1 p.m. for lunch. Lady Wilder wants help with some sort of guest list. You can take her to lunch. But perhaps Mr. Dowling has a previous appointment. Oh, no, no, not at all. Take her somewhere decent. I'm sure the taxpayers won't mind. Thank you. We'll order in a few minutes. What do you think? I had Moule Marinier here once. They practically poisoned me. I meant the file I sent you. I thought it was somewhat confused. Then really? Why should I travel to Vienna in company with a film unit? Why should I travel to Vienna at all? Because those bumpkins in the Kremlin decided to send their tanks into Czechoslovakia. A cryptic, if not an oracular pie. Is that the kind of lunch we're going to have? At first, the Warsaw Pact countries who were against it thought they might be able to contain it. Some of them are beginning to have doubts. Among the refugees coming out, there are some very important people, and they need to be looked after at a very high level. They already have an ambassador to Austria, resident as it happens in Vienna. And apparently, we need a more direct contact. We've come a long way from building roads, haven't we? Who are you working for now? Am I five, six, or seven? It comes under the heading of Special Situations and Trade, for which I'm the minister and you're the ambassador. Well, I have been asked. And now you have been briefed. You've been told, Kelsey? Right? Yes, I've been told. Very well. Now, answer my original question. Why do I have to travel with a lot of long-haired filmmakers? <laughs> well, you've got a very blimpish attitude towards creative people, John. They're making a film about refugees. Why specifically do they have to travel in an ambassador's party? Well, it's, uh, it's an official film. Official films are being made every day. They don't need an ambassador to hold their hands. Why, Caswell? Well, uh, apparently... <coughs> you don't know, do you? Who's pulling your strings, hmm? All right, I can see it's pointless to ask you questions. The long-haired producer who's making this film is lunching with us, as a matter of fact. I didn't think they let people like that in here. His name is, um, Stephen Wales. Oh. Who are these people that I'm supposed to meet? You'll meet mainly a man called Vaclav Vysek. Vaclav Vysek? What's he? Well, actually, he's a poet. Very well known. Would you like me to hire a long wig before I go? He was also in their Ministry for Foreign Affairs. They order things differently all the time. Obviously. Still, I suppose a poet can't do much more harm than professional politicians. <laughs> At least he can make it all sound prettier. <laughs> Not with a tank looking over his shoulder. Anyway, we have every confidence. Confidence, Lord Bly, is the feeling one has before one understands the problem. Caswell. Oh, uh, hello. Nice to see you. I don't think you two know each other. Uh, Sir John Wilder, Lord Branhilly. How do you do? I do. Mm, will you have a drink? That's very civil of you. Have a gin. Wait. Water, if I may. When's this? Beatnik film fellow of yours turning up, if ever he does. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, John. Uh, this is Stephen Wales. How <laughs> Beatnik film fellow. Well, the title is just one of those comic Irish ones left over from the bad old days. I never use it professionally. I see. What does your family crest feature? The cloak or the dagger? I'm sorry. Hmm? I should try the Moule Marinière, Caswell. They're delicious. Well, I don't think it'll be possible at the moment. We 
Yes, I know. It's just that I've got three or four things I must get finished. Well, I might be able to get away the weekend after next. You've done an IP32 on this. Why can't we hear the woman? How's that? Who is it? His mother? Well, all right, I'll try and get up to see you the weekend after next. Look after yourself. Okay, bye-bye then. Phoning somebody else. Is that Mr. Barton? It was Lincoln Dowling here. Look, Mr. Barton, when I brought my car in, I told your chap I was pretty sure it's trouble with the fuel supply. As far as I can see, all he's done is blow the plugs. I'm still getting the same trouble. I don't consider this good enough. Look, I haven't time to bring my car in again. Nobs. Can you send one of your chaps? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Good, Good morning. Today. Yes, of course. I need the car all week. Delighted. Yes. Why, darling? <laughs> he has possibilities. I've been looking at his file. Oh, yes. Interesting. Yes. I in what way? What possibilities? He's in the right place. You think so? Wilder has a roving commission, and it will carry Mr. Dowling with it, often to places of interest to us. Good thinking. Where might it carry him at the moment? We have arranged for Wilder to go to Vienna, ostensibly to meet some important refugees. Ostensibly? Among those coming out will be some of our people, and the couple who are coming over to us. We must make immediate contact. And Sir John Wilder won't be doing it, I take it. Well, we're not actually very interested in the people he may or may not be meeting. May not? Well, we have actually invented these people. Neither Wilder nor Bly, no. Well, there may be a couple of politicians arriving he can make himself amiable towards. The point was that we had to make it look like a front office job. Lord Bly, for reasons of his own, wasn't unhappy about Wilder being out of the country and Wilder's face fits. Dear me, how he'd hate to hear that. Yes, I'm sure he would, yes. And Mr. Darling? Yes? He's been approached before, you know, when he was at university. One of our chaps at King's had a word with him. He turned it down. Oh, partly on conscience grounds. He thought the work was nasty. Which it often is. And partly because of his career. I think he's getting himself into a situation where he'll find it's better for his career that he does, rather than doesn't. It always pays to wait with these ambitious young men. They inevitably end up. Langrost. With one foot in the soup. Yeah. Nobs. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Apparently, he's not having soup. He's having avocado pear. Just what I feel like. Is this very embarrassing for you? I'm sorry? Having me dumped on you. No, no, of course not. Not at all. But it is a little. Is it one of your functions, whining and dining wives? Or mistresses? As far as I know, Sir John hasn't got a mistress. As far as either of us knows. Well, naturally, I didn't mean that I... <laughs> of course you didn't. But being a man, he wouldn't have said, even if you knew he had. Being a man, I would never have mentioned it. But being a woman, you, of course, had to. Why do you imagine I had to? In case you might find something out. Women are masochists. I have to keep sticking the tongue into the hollow tooth to see if it still aches. I suppose you know a lot about John, don't you? Do I? Is there a dossier, everything written down? Now that I've seen. I suppose that answer comes under the heading of diplomacy. It actually comes under the heading of fact. Cheers. Cheers. We seem to have got up slightly on the wrong foot today, don't we? I think it'd be all right. You know, when I first met you, I was afraid you were going to be one of those creepy foreign office gigolos with a pound and a half of cotton wool between the ears. <laughs> well, there aren't quite so many of those as there used to be. Uh, didn't you want me to have a look at a guest list? Oh, yes. It's, um, it's not quite complete yet. You'll probably be able to tell me if I'm heading in the right direction. Not knowing many of the people involved, I'm not sure on what basis one includes them in or not. The safest method is, if they wear well, invite them again. Ah, Sir Walter Frame is having a life and death struggle with Lord Malham's department over immigrations and race relations. It's reached the point where their wives aren't speaking. Well, which one of them do I drop? Mm, the Malhams. He's going to win. But when the immigration business is settled, he'll almost certainly be kicked upstairs into the Lords, and Frame will move in on account of his African connections. 
Mm. I see you've got Lady Fellowship down. Uh, he's chasing my husband. He's chasing everybody's husband. Straight through this building as it happened. Pamela, darling, how lovely. And Mr. Downing, what fun. Hello, Margot. How are you, Lady Fellowship? No, 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 please sit down, dear. I'm just hurtling through for a little snack. Uh, this is Henry. He's uh, my husband's assistant, just as Mr. Downing is your husband's assistant. I always think it's terribly sweet of them to pick such good-looking young men. Not that Henry's all that great, tricks. Mr. Downing's rather pretty, though, don't you think? Super. How's poor John? Poor John is very well, thank you. I suppose he's managing at home on a sandwich and a meat pie, poor dear. That's so unlikely as to be hysterical. Well, come on, Henry. We've got a full day ahead of us. I hope we see you sometime towards the end of the month. Bye. I think Henry falls into your category of a pound and a half of cotton wool. Well, we can cross that cow off the list for a start. Well, do start your avocado. I'm starving. Oh, sorry. Why did she say the end of the month? Has word got out already? What's the date of your party? 28th. Why? That's unfortunate. Why? Oh, don't tell me. She rang up this morning to ask if Sir John, and by inference you... Without actually mentioning my name. ...would be free for a little cocktail party she's giving on... On the 28th. 28th. Oh, damn her eyes. Which means I'm afraid that most of the people on your list will also be unheard. Lady Fellowship's little cocktail parties usually entail 150 people. Why can't she stick to adultery? At least it doesn't tie up half London. What makes you think that? <laughs> oh. Damn. My first diplomatic party, too. What can we do? How about trying to put the skids under her? Could we? Might be amusing to try. It's about time Margot Fellowship had a fall on her. Absolutely enormous. Quite. How? Well, if we took the six or seven key names and got them to accept your party first, you'd either have to change the date or give up. Now I can see why John chose you. He didn't. Never mind. I think perhaps we shouldn't give Margot Fellowship too much ammunition for her libelous tongue, do you? Sorry. It's all right. I was only joking. She wouldn't need it. I doubt whether anybody else would take the slightest interest. <laughs> Harry, on Tuesday they had lunch together. Yesterday he took her to tea. Oh, I must say, she really is a most attractive woman. Wouldn't you say? Oh, come on, Hesketh. Mr. Nightingale here has been a great assistance to me in going into this matter. By that, I suppose you mean in having him followed, tapping his phone calls and generally invading his privacy. That's right. We do actually regret many of the things we have to do, Jason. Still, as you always say, it's for the good of the country. Yes. I must say, intellectually, I'm not wholly happy about some of my country's pursuits. But it's the only country I have. What's Mr. Dowling's function in Sir John Wilder's office, Jason? Well, he's here. No, 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 no. What's he there for? Wouldn't I be right in supposing that he's there on somebody's behalf to make sure that Sir John Wilder, the outsider, the non-professional diplomat, doesn't do too well? Everybody protects their own interests, Jason. I take it you want me to speak to Lincoln, tell him to see less of Lady Wilder in case of scandal, is that it? Oh, good heavens, no. We mustn't invade all his areas of privacy. As a matter of fact, the possibility of a scandal could well be of enormous help to us, couldn't it? Hethcote, you're disgusting. Oh, no, no, Jason. I'm far from disgusting. But I am quite efficient, though. When you were a professor of Greek, I quite liked you. I suppose you're after your K, like everyone else. The world, Jason, the world. We are its playthings. I wouldn't mind the K, though. I'm not overjoyed at the idea that one of my people will be working for you. Well, at least, my dear, you'll know that this one is working for us, won't you? I think we're having some success. Oh, how marvellous. At least four out of six haven't received invitations from her yet. I had a word with their secretaries and let it be known that you're having a party on the 28th. And of the two, yours might be the more valuable. When will they get their summonses? Well, probably today. I posted them last night. And I should imagine they'll accept for you first. Lincoln, you're absolutely marvellous. 
I don't know what I'd do without you. Uh, yeah. Okay, bye. You're early? I've come to collect my pyjamas and toothbrush. Are you camping out? I have to go to Caswell's for the weekend. Something has to be sorted out. Do you want to come? It'll only be business. Or tonight? But we can't go tonight. We're dining Dowling. Oh, you, you'll have to put him off. Put him off? At this hour? Well, you'll have to dine him yourself. I don't suppose you'll find that much of a hardship. Oh, by the way, all those clothes that you bought for jet-setting around the world with me, is there anything suitable for the Czech border? Well, what would I need? A bulletproof bra? Why? I have to go to Vienna. I thought you might like me to save you the last waltz. It's not already spoken for. Good. Why are we dining darling? Well, you know, he's helping me organise my party. Oh, well, that's another thing. Your party's off. Off? What do you mean, off? I've chartered a plane for Vienna for the 28th. It's certainly not off. But he was to be here. I've given parties before when he hasn't turned up, for one reason or another. Well... Now, don't you get cold feet. At least three or four of our main guests will be coming because they'll be hoping to get Sir John's ear about something or other during the evening. And if I cry off now, Marco Fellowship will get absolutely striped with delight. <laughs> That's a very feminine argument. That's a very feminine dilemma. Do you think we can go through with it? Well, the freeloaders won't care if neither of you has, as long as there's food and drink and lustful wives to chat up. And as long as his trip isn't made public, which it won't be until it's too late, the others will have to come out of politeness. Well, there we are, then. Yes, I suppose we are. You disapprove? No. Yes, you do. You think women oughtn't to give parties. They give them for the wrong reason. Don't they? Well, parties organised by men would turn out to be either board meetings or orgies. Mm, both of which have certain interests. Oh, go on. You're just trying to impress me. You're a man of the world. I bet you've never been to an orgy in your life. Have you? I've been to a board meeting. Orgies are just as dull. Oh, go on. You haven't been to one. Have you? Well... Really? In a place called Baharish. It was either that or insult the Sheikh. He thought he was being polite to us, so we had to go through with it. It was awful. Well, what happened? No, oh, you don't want to hear. Well, what happened? What did you have to do? Well, there was this enormous tent. And the floor was covered with the most fabulously expensive Bukhara carpets. And down the middle was this long, long table. And right at the end were about twenty... Twenty what? Young girls. What were they wearing? Well... Anything? A sort of filmy... Go on. Well, you know that for Arabs, the sheep's eye is considered a great delicacy. Well, every plate was heaped with sheep's eyes. They must have killed thousands of sheep. Anyway, these girls each picked up a plate and brought them to us, and then they went back and fetched another plate. It was very rude to refuse, particularly as they'd practically decimated their herds for us. And then brought the next plate, and then back for another, and then another, and then another. What, what, what happened afterwards? We all belched. You have to belch, you know. Yes, yes, of course. And then the sheikh put on a Rolling Stones record, and we all dropped off to sleep. You rotten thing. Well, you did ask. You've never been in a shake's tent in your life. I have, as a matter of fact. And there were girls there, but they're only there to serve the food. And they were very unattractive. And their hair was smarmed down with goat butter. I spent the evening talking about the economics of drilling for oil on the shake's land. No orgies? Not even a blue film. They all think that's part of the decadent European setup. Actually, he did have a Chinese cook who killed himself with an axe. With an axe? The Sheikh brought in a verdict of chop suicide. You, you're a terrible liar and you tell wrong jokes. I thought it was rather funny. Are you going with John to wherever it is? I should be, but no. Good. I meant, I have to have someone to make sure that everybody who's important is introduced to everybody else who's important. Oh, yes. I'm going to see if dinner's ready. Oh, um, w w would you like another drink? No, no, thanks. Are we dining alone? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid so. John had to go to the country and there wasn't time to invite anyone else. Is that all right? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Yes, just a minute. Just a minute, I think, yeah.
What's this one? Nightingale. This one here. Nineteen and six for a taxi? Well, it's quite reasonable. The traffic was at a standstill. But where on earth did you go? Brighton? This isn't the old MI6 anymore, you know. I take it to be quite justifiable. Everything is changing, Nightingale. Either I do the job as I see fit, or... But I can't put in an expense chit for 19 and 6 for a taxi. They'd have my guts for whatever it is. You have to carry some of it yourself. Make it 10 bob. I'm not going to subsidise a bloody government. <laughs> it was 19 and 6 and 19 and... Mobs. Yes, 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 thank you. You're going to be up all night. Nightingale here, sir. And don't try and put in for more yes, than sir. a sandwich and a thermos of coffee. Uh, yes, sir. I've got my eye on you, Nightingale. Uh, yes, sir. Six. Excellent dinner, Caswell. I suppose now you are a lord, you feel it incumbent upon you to live like one. I always have, John. My elevation merely confirmed my natural inclinations. Oh. We have come a long way from paving stones and sewage disposal, haven't we? Oh, I don't know. Baronies have been founded on much less substantial foundations. It is only life period, Caswell, isn't it? Not a dynasty. Did you know that uh, real cigar connoisseurs smoke their cigars with the band on? Or off? It's a matter of complete indifference to them. No, I didn't know that. It's merely become rather a middle-class tradition to always remove it. I suppose they didn't want to appear ostentatious in always buying the best. Well, because they'd achieved wealth late in life, they were uncertain of themselves of what they were buying. The connoisseurs know they're always smoking the best. Therefore, it makes no odds whether the band is there or not. Can I give you light? Oh, thank you. <laughs> is, um, Pamela going with you? I think so. It'll make a nice trip for the two of you. Now, let's see. You leave on the 28th. Now, how do you want me to handle this um, debt singer meeting? I don't want you to handle this debt singer meeting. Well, I'll handle it. He's arriving on the 29th. I made an arrangement with him for the 10th next month. Oh, but he cabled me to say that uh, he had to be in New York on the 31st and that he'd call in on his way. Didn't they send on this memo to you? All right, Caswell. Get somebody else to get your blasted refugees out. I'm not going. You are going, John. Forget it. John, you're stuck with it. It's already been announced that you'll be in Vienna at that time. Now, when these people come out, you'll be there to make quite clear our own country's future political and military interests. Now, anyone substituting for you now would simply be a sign to these Warsaw Pact people that uh, we aren't as interested in what is happening there as we pretended to be. Besides, it's been mooted that uh, you are to visit the frontier. Now, we wouldn't want to have thought that you were afraid for your own skin. Did you know that Dead Singer had altered the date of this meeting before you landed me with this trip? In fact, I get a feeling in this case that a refusal to go might well be a resignation matter. No, silly to get involved in all that of a simple little meeting that I can handle perfectly well myself. A simple little meeting? Something which might affect the whole of the financial structure of half of Western Europe. And there are people, apparently, who wonder in things like this Detzinger affair just how much you're pursuing your own interests and how much the country's. Now, my handling it will take away their ammunition. You know perfectly well, Caswell. If I can get out of this trip, I will. I have no doubt. But now that you're here, let's discuss both projects in a civilized way. Oh. I think the bend on your cigars caught fire. Maybe the middle class knew what they were doing after all. My fault.
father never wanted me to win a croquet match, let alone a scholarship. Go on. Are you sure you're interested? Very. You reached Manchester Grammar School. Oh, and then three years at Cambridge. The only other thing that interested me was cybernetics. It seemed to me if one assumed the human body was the most magnificent machine that existed, it could be used as a basis for building other magnificent machines. Not to help people do less, but to free them to do more. But you chose the Foreign Office. Yes, I agree with you. I thought at that time most of the centres of influence in this country were filled with people who had a pound and a half of cotton wool between their ears. Pretty arrogant assumption, really. Yeah, but not far off the mark. A bit off, but not all that far. Trouble is, the office changes the man, whatever good intent they set out with. You know, I think we've come to the end of an era. All these simultaneous demonstrations and upheavals all over the world, for the same principles, aren't really to bring about change, because that change has happened. And the people are fed up with not having it ratified. I think the job of people like me is to help absorb the changes into society and make them work. But are you in a position to? No. But you are ambitious? Probably. Then you probably be able to. Tell me, why have you been doing something as trivial as helping me arrange a party? Because I think Margot Fellowship is one of the pound and a half of cotton wool people, and I don't see why they should always win. <laughs> and you think I'm not a cotton wool person? No. No, I don't think you are. Thank you, kind sir, she said. Except that you have their flippancy. Perhaps because you're all afraid of showing very simple emotions. Am I? I don't know. Are you? What an extraordinary question. What? What? I, um... I'm simply going to ask, if you had taken up cybernetics, what... It's almost one o'clock. I should be going. If I had taken up cybernetics, I would have made a machine that whistled to itself as it worked, quietly, so as not to disturb anybody else. Thank you for coming to dinner. Wilder in the country didn't return. Thank you, Nightingale. You can trot along to bed now. I think perhaps the time has come to approach, Mr. Darling. Sit down, Lincoln. Thank you. You know Professor Mobbs? Well, I know of him, of course. As what? as the author of a book on the Peloponnesian Wars. Oh, yes. Well, that was a few years ago. Why? Oh, I just wondered. I'm, uh, I'm lunching with him. Wilder's little jaunt all arranged, is it? Yes, he leaves the day after tomorrow, 28th. You're getting on with him all right, are you? Yes, I think so. He's unorthodox, but I find that something of an advantage. Good. You haven't been approached by anyone, have you, recently? Approached? You find yourself attracted to unorthodoxy, do you? Well, not specifically. What did you mean, had I been approached? You find in your job that you will, of course, from time to time, have people hoping that you may be able to help them with theirs. I obviously don't mean foreign agents. We often have to entertain them to learn of their contacts or to confide misinformation. One's attitude as to whether or not one is prepared to be of assistance must, of course, in the long run, be up to oneself. You realize I'm not talking of journalists and that like? I think I know what you mean. And naturally, we don't gaze with any delight on any form of double allegiance, although we recognize that some have to come about. What I'm really trying to point out to you is that in order to be able to resist, should one wish to, 
the advances of any external interests, one must keep one's life excessively tidy. I quite understand that. Yes. Well, naturally, I don't wish to intrude on what is in fact your private life and which I'm sure is responsibly conducted. As far as possible. Yes, quite. However, should you ever be approached, it uh, may be that it's already too late. I don't understand you. Well, quite understandably, you don't. All of which seems to show that there's nothing to it. However, it could be construed on... what? You've been seeing rather a lot of Lady Wilder. I've been doing nothing more than help her with a guest list for a party she's giving. Lincoln. As men, we can always find time to assist attractive women in the most trivial preoccupations. We don't seem to be able to find quite so much time to assist the unattractive ones. I assure you. Yes, do, Lincoln. Do assure me. Oh, well, yes, all right. It's probably quite true. Yes? In what sense? Only in the sense you say. Good. Well, now, having settled that... Yes? Oh, yes, ask him to come in, would you? You say you haven't met Professor Moggs before? No, I haven't. Hello, Margot. And Pamela, darling. Darling, I was just going to phone you to thank you for your invitation. You get mine? This morning? Well, isn't it awful both giving parties on the same day? John, darling, you'll have to keep us both happy and amused. Do you issue return tickets? It would appear that I shan't be at either. Oh, won't you? Or neither will poor William. His cousins died in the funerals on the 28th in Mablethorpe or some extraordinary place. Are you going? There's nothing in the marriage ceremony about loving and cherishing one's husband's cousins. Well, I hardly knew the man. Well, who would? Mabel thought I asked. Still, it's all going to be great fun. Two marvellous parties at the same time. Everyone's wildly excited. Well, I must fly. Bye. Bye. The cow's going through with it. Which cow? I wouldn't recommend any protest, Minister. Dowling's got enough on his plate working for this office. It's really politic to embarrass security. Not the most hygienic of people, but they can have their uses. Like helping you to keep tabs on Wilder? I feel sure you're as keen to be kept informed as any of us. As long as you pass on to me, all they pass on to you. Of course, Minister. Good. Good. What do you say uh, his name is? Hobbs? No. Mobs. Write it down for me. Well, I need just a little more of those. Yes. Yes. Oh, doesn't that look good? Thank you. Thank you. Doesn't that look splendid? They do a very good... Thank you. ...quarter of lamb. This was a put-up job, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. What was, dear boy? Do start. You coming to lunch with Fowler, me being there, and then Fowler getting a message which meant he couldn't join us. It does sound a bit suspicious put like that, doesn't it? Mint sauce? No, thank you. No? Oh, I don't think it's out of a jar. You say you read my book? Mm, several years ago. Hmm, yes, it was written several years ago. Have you read any others since then? Alas. Too busy. You have a most penetrating way of making conversation, dear boy. Don't you have any small talk? I'm not much good at it. Oh, I adore small talk. Gossip, I always say, is the, the stuff of literature. Did I say that, or did someone else say it? How's your meat? Very good. And history, too, the um, stuff of um, literature. We, you and I, this whole room, the world, are merely, you might say, stepping stones on the way to history. How do you think they will read of us in the years to come, this country? Well, providing they do. 
that's always assuming that, of course. Might we not read Etonian hypothesis? Might they not say? But finally, when their tribal rules became meaningless, they went mad. And like the Brontosaurus, unable to adapt, became extinct and turned into an attraction at a tourist centre. I wasn't going to say that at all. What were you going to say? I was going to say, we might read, that as a nation, its previous trade outlets dwindling, it found it could only penetrate its new areas of influence with a new kind of diplomacy. And that new diplomacy being? Oh, shall we say that it's spearhead, it's trade. Followed by? But I suppose it comes these days under the heading of public relations. Or what in the old days used to be called spying. Oh, I do think that's a most unpleasant and inaccurate word. Unpleasant, but not inaccurate. But these days the objectives are so much more... Well, that's only academic. And don't you believe that we should maintain our influence in these areas with every means possible? Yes, I suppose in fact yes, I do. Of course you do, and so do all the other nations. My dear fellow, the trouble we have here with the... C-I-A, here, there, and everywhere. It's terribly busy, people. Mr. Mobbs, what are you proposing to me? We require your assistance. And what if I refuse? Oh, my dear fellow, nothing, absolutely nothing. This isn't the KGB. Isn't it? I was warned this morning that my friendship with a certain lady could well be misconstrued in some quarters. Oh, dear boy, what an awful thing to suggest. Well, presumably you actually want me to work for you, or you wouldn't have approached me. Well, of course we want you to work for us. We'd be most pleased to have you with us. But you'd be prepared to write it off if I said no. Oh, we'd have to, dear boy. We'd have to, wouldn't we, and no hard feeling. But what would happen to the dossier you must have built up on me? You'd destroy it? Well, that is one of the least likable parts of our job. It covers such a wide area, you see. In what way? So many departments use us, you see. It's often quite dreadful, I agree, but the sort of thing that might happen, say, was that you were up for promotion to a job that was pretty heavily classified. Is he secure, they might say? Is anything known? Is he circumspect in his relations with, say, women? And among others, they would quite probably come to us. I see. Not a concern that seems to have troubled them much in the past. Well, things have changed. Oh, everything is changing, isn't it? <laughs> but of course, this is only a hypothesis. Naturally, we'd like you to join us because you wanted to join us. You would be less worried had I not been entirely circumspect with, say, women. Oh, my dear fellow, I'm sure there's nothing to it. And in any case, that liaison could well be a great help to us. But which I wouldn't be prepared to use. Oh, no, we wouldn't ask you to, my dear boy. We wouldn't ask you to. Would uh, Fowler know about that? Oh, yes, certainly. How would he feel? Oh, Jason wouldn't object. He was once with our department before the war. He has one blazing star of achievement beside his name. He'd recruited Kim Philby. Eat up your meat, dear boy, eat it up. I suppose in the nature of things, it's bound to become more difficult to weigh things against each other to know what is right and what is wrong. We seem to be pursued into necessity. I sometimes think the Greek idea of the angry fates wasn't so far off the mark. One does something because it seems right, because it seems to be the things one believes one stands for. Humanity, the country only to find one has done it for quite the opposite reasons. And even then one can't be sure where right or wrong comes into it. I suppose the decay of religion took away our sense of moral absolutes. Makes it quite impossible to give advice. Did you accept? Yes, I suppose so, more or less. Well, I expect it'll help your promotion. <laughs> Splendid party, Pamela. Thank you, Gazel. How did you manage to get all these people together at the same time? I had a little help. Splendid. 
Did uh, John go off all right? Oh, yes, yes. He left this morning. Unfortunately, he'll miss a very important meeting, but uh, no doubt I'll be able to take over. I'm sure you can, Caswell. <laughs> Margot Fellowship was having a party tonight as well, but she phoned, cancelling. Yes, apparently her husband's cousin died rather suddenly. She felt she just had to go to the funeral. She's very devoted to her family, you know. Yes. Well, lovely party, Pam. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. How did you do it? I telephoned out Essential Six on a quite different matter and happened to mention that Willie Fellowship's cousin had died and the funeral would be on the 28th. Therefore, it was unlikely that Margot, etc., etc. They all phoned her up offering their condolences, hoping to see her when she got back from the funeral. She couldn't not go. Yes, I believe it's quite delightful in Mablethorpe at this time of year. Yes, one gets such a splendid view of the holiday camp. <laughs> now, what else can I do for you? Well, um, you can hang around until afterwards and help with the washing up, if you like. All right. John, darling, I thought you weren't going to be here. <laughs> they weren't there, Caswell. Well, what happened to them? Apparently a group of distinguished refugees crossed the border yesterday with no trouble at all. They were met by a group of Americans who put them on a scheduled KLM flight to New York. There were three journalists, a professor of philology, and a team of heart transplant surgeons. Nobody called Bisec to be seen anywhere. No? Oh. There was a man called Mobs wandering around looking very worried. Do you know him? No. So I caught the next plane home. Our people th there thought it was the best thing to do. I don't blame you, Caswell. I think probably we've both been used. You can spare the time. I can't. Anyway, whoever came out, the CIA got them. Which means that I can come to your party after all. Cool. Well, we let us circulate, I suppose. <laughs> What did you do? Bribe the CIA? You don't have to bribe the CIA. They believe in free enterprise. And that's what fleeing communists are looking for first. Oh, by the way, about Detzinger. I cabled him to say that I would be at the meeting after all. They catch fire terribly easily, you know. <laughs> 